This episode of Humble History covers one of the greatest travelers of all time, the legendary Ibn Battuta, who crisscrossed most of the world in the 14th century, covering different parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe. His accounts of his 30 year long travels leaves us with arguably the best first hand account of the medieval world. So, who was Ibn Battuta and what did his account say? Let's get into it right now. Ibn Battuta was born to a family of Islamic scholars in Tangiers, Morocco. Following his family's tradition, he became a Qadi or a juror in the Islamic tradition. After spending almost all of his life in Morocco, he begins his travels to conduct the Hajj, or a pilgrimage expected of all Muslims to travel from their home country to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. As Ibn Battuta travels across North Africa on his way to Mecca, his motivation goes from wanting to conduct a Hajj to a love of travel in general. We see his flair for travel ignite particularly in his time in Egypt. Ibn Battuta recounts a dream he had during a stay in Alexandria. I dreamed that I was on the wing of a huge bird, which flew with me in the direction of the Qibla, then made towards the Yemen, then eastwards, then went towards the south, and finally made a long flight towards the east, alighted in some dark and greenish country, and left me there. Inspired by the dream, Ibn Battuta takes the long way from Egypt to Mecca, and visits a few different countries in the Middle East before making his way to Mecca. After completing his Hajj, Ibn Battuta sets off again, this time going as far east to Persia in modern day Iran, before traveling back again to Saudi Arabia and doing his second Hajj. After that, as you can imagine, he travels again, but this time heading south past Yemen, going along the East African coast and going as far as the then major trading city Kilwa, which is found in current day Tanzania, before sailing north back to Saudi Arabia and conducting his third and final Hajj. So far in Ibn Battuta's travels, we see that his motivation has gone from a religious rite to being motivated by the joy of travel and exploration and wanderlust. And now on this leg, we will see his motivation turn again to a much more universally relatable motivation, which is the pursuit of a paying job. As we saw earlier, Ibn Battuta was a juror by profession. And all the places that Ibn Battuta had traveled to were filled with jurors. This meant high competition for jobs. So he decided to journey off to the frontiers of the Islamic world, to the places where Islam was just being introduced or expanded, thus giving him a better chance of being employed in the court of a sultan or, or a ruler. And that is exactly what he did when he travels north up to modern day Turkey, where the Seljuk Turks are expanding their rule and introducing Islam to a greater portion of the country. And his plan works as he works for the Seljuk rulers. From there, he is hired again by a different ruler to go to a different ruler in what is today the Ukraine. Ibn Battuta was not a fan of the northern climate of both Ukraine and, or Turkey. So he comes up with another plan to serve a different sultan in a different part of the world. It is at this point he decides that he will travel to India to go to go to work for one of the most richest Muslim rulers at the time, a ruler called Muhammad ibn Tughluq. So he begins his journey south, traveling through most of Asia, taking his time and enjoying the travel as always, before arriving in India at the court of Muhammad ibn Tughluq. After arriving in India at the court 
with the Sultan, even Batuta's plans work. He takes favor with the Sultan and becomes his juror and amasses more money than he has ever had. It seems that all is going well for even Batuta, except the unexpected fact that Sultan Muhammad ibn Tagluk is a bloodthirsty tyrant who kills both foes and friends in what seems to be at whim. Now, Ibn Battuta finds himself trapped at the capricious court of Muhammad ibn Tugluk. He stays there for several years before finding the perfect escape. Ibn Battuta is assigned as the Sultan's ambassador to China. Jumping at the opportunity, Ibn Battuta sails off to China, but his plans are quickly interrupted as he is robbed of all his belongings by pirates on the sea. With barely any money, he manages to take a ship to the Maldives. After recuperating, he quickly goes to China. There he's able to reamass some of his wealth and explore the vast Chinese lands. But after 25 years of travel, Ibn Battuta is homesick. In his own accounts, Ibn Battuta writes, I was moved by memories of my homeland, affection for my family and dear friends who drew me toward my land, which in my opinion, was better than any other country. And with these thoughts and feelings, Ibn Battuta journeys back to Morocco. On his return from China, he finds that most of Eurasia and other parts of the world have been affected by the Black Death, a plague that killed millions of people. But perhaps the deaths that affected Ibn Battuta the most were those of his parents, both of which he was not around for and only found out after his return. He only stays in Morocco for four days before traveling again, this time to Spain, the other frontier of the Islamic world, and then goes to West Africa through the Mali Empire before being called back by the ruler of Morocco. And after over 30 years of travel, even Batuta spends the rest of his life in Morocco. Out of all the takeaways we can derive from Ibn Battuta's life and adventures, in my opinion the thing that stands out the most is the resemblance of the 13th century world to that of our 21st century world. And there are three resemblances that stick out to me the most. First is the level of interconnectedness of different countries. In our globalized time it is easy to think that the nations of the past were ignorant of one another or existed in isolation. But even Batuta shows us that this was not the case and that the medieval world was much more connected than we think. Secondly, we see that economic migration is nothing new either. Even Batuta, for a great portion of his travels, was an economic migrant. He went to Turkey and Ukraine and India looking for work. In today's world, he could have been accused of stealing jobs, but even, but even Batuta's case was nothing rare or unique. This is very similar to our time, where we see people moving from one side of the world to the other to fulfill their economic needs. And lastly, in our times, it is very easy to see traveling or wanderlust or seeking adventure as a modern creation as a luxury and at worst as a waste. But the accounts of Ibn Battuta shows us that this feeling that drives many to pursue wanderlust is a feeling that has crossed civilization for centuries and in my opinion is enough reason for us to take these desires for travel and adventure more seriously than we usually do. The fact that Ibn Battuta travels across the world because of a vision he has of a giant bird, both humanizes him to a great extent and, and gives greater significance to our want for travel as, at the same time. Those are only a few takeaways from Ibn Battuta's life and journey. If you would like to share what some takeaways that you found or that you think we missed, please leave them in the comment section. If you would like to know more about even Batuta's travels and life. In the description section, you will find two resources that give more detail about Ibn Batuta's life, life and travel. 
They are definitely worth a look if you want to know more on the topic. And that is it for this episode of Humble History. Until we meet again on the next episode, I hope you go wherever the wings of your great bird take you.